Let's turn our Bibles this morning back to Acts chapter 7. We're going to finish the 7th chapter. And when we get into the 8th chapter, we're going to be looking at um, Saul, or Paul the Pharisee, um, and the persecution of the church. And we're going to also be looking at a very interesting topic uh, in chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse... I think it's verse 13, how to believe in Jesus Christ, be baptized, and still be lost. So it should be most interesting, um, our studies, excuse me, our studies uh, in um, the book of Acts coming up. Hopefully you're prepared for the truth because it's just going to be that. And uh, we have to learn to handle the truth and deal with it. And so during our last time, we're looking at this wonderful man, Stephen. Uh, we got to uh, verse 50, 54. I'm just going to go back as he addresses this crowd um, that they couldn't debate him and argue with him about the things of Christ. They couldn't withstand the, the power and the spirit um, which he had. They could not withstand um, what he was saying. It was so full of the spirit of God, full of power, full of wisdom that it just confused his hearers. And I think the one thing that happens, it's clear to me in the text, that when you are able to um, talk with someone who's trying to debate with you about the faith, and you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the power of God, they have neither, and all they do is get confused and angry. They get angry eventually, and they lash out at you at various ways. Um, in this particular chapter, chapter 7, they lashed out at Stephen by killing him. That's all they can do. And that was really the beginning of the onslaught of persecution against the whole church. Um, it was towards the leaders at the first, and now we're going to see uh, in chapter 8 that it's going to go full, full tilt. And yet, even in that, that's going to... Um, be used by God to fulfill his plan, as we'll see. Uh, what was Stephen's conclusion of these men in his preaching and teaching? Amazing what he said. He said, verse 51, You stiff neck and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. They were resisting the Holy Spirit. And how was that seen in a more practical sense? In verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? So he shows them that their resistance of the Holy Spirit and the resistance of their fathers to the Holy Spirit was seen in how they treated or mistreated the prophets. Now everybody knows that God sent the prophets to the people to warn them of coming judgment if they would not repent. That was the purpose of the prophets. People think in our age that prophets are sent on the scene to promise to get you stuff. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, every time you see a prophet on the scene, there's trouble ahead. God sent the prophets to warn the people to turn back to him. And anyone with a brain that's working can see that. And everyone else trying to give you the impression that the ministry of the prophets uh, was to prophesy stuff for you is a bunch of nonsense. All you have to do is open up that Bible that you refuse to open up and see what it says, and you'll be able to understand exactly what the plan of God is. He says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and ye have slain them, which show before of the coming of the just one, who is Christ, of whom ye have been now the betrayer and murderers. So he's saying, Your actions are similar to your father's actions, and your resistance of the Holy Spirit, and how you killed the prophets, who God sent to direct you, to the coming of the just one, namely Christ Jesus, and you went on ahead and killed him. You're no different than your fathers were. He said, speaking of their fathers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. I mean, you have to really sit and think about what he's saying. This is a huge statement on the part of Stephen. When you think about the entire intricate nature of the law, how it was received and how it was implemented, and how we as Gentiles, and most of us in the church, are tree-stumbly ignorant of the law. And know very little of it. 
I mean, when you really study the Bible and see how the law was dispensed and the purpose of it, it's a magnificent thing that God did. And they had it. The Jews had it. And what did they do with it? They never kept it. They never kept it. And the, the, the ultimate evidence of that was how they treated or mistreated Christ. That's it. Everything goes back to Christ. Everything goes back to Christ. So this is or was a summary of Stephen's message and a summary of the nation of Israel as a whole. They were apostate and they still are even to this day. Israel continued to refuse to obey the movement of God that is the Holy Spirit throughout their entire history and it's true today. It's true to this moment. And though that may offend the ignorant, I can't help that. I mean, you choose to stay ignorant uh, and to believe John Hagee's reprobate nonsense more than you do God's. Israel is an apostasy. They always have been. And if you don't see it, that's your issue. It's not the issue of me, and it's certainly not the issue of Scripture, because the, the Bible is clear that they still are. They persecuted and killed the messengers of God and the, the messengers God sent uh, to them to bless them. They didn't care. The height of their blindness and their rebellion was seen in that they killed Jesus. And we looked at, in closing, the question needs to be asked and answered, how do you resist the Holy Spirit? And we looked at four things. We're just going to go over those again. It begins in the heart and with the will. He said, ye stiff neck in heart and ears. So it begins in the heart and with the will. Once that heart is hardened, then your ears are hardened. You can't hear anything. It's amazing. Number two, it was a common practice. He says, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. It was a common practice. You have to rem <laughs> I don't know if I could even begin to teach you with the, how you can grasp this. Their entire history, from their conception until this moment that we're sitting here right now has been one of resistance of the Holy Spirit. It still is. It's remarkable. You can't go over there and preach Christ. Anyone telling you that you can is crazy. Or he's doing it in secret. Or he's doing it way off the grid. But it's not something you could publicly do. You can't do it. You can't go over there and build a church. I think we're going to build a church. and I think not. I think you're going to go back to your country where you came from, they don't want to hear about Christ. And people stupidly and blindly believe that these people are followers of God. They are not. And if anyone had the sense to read the book of Romans, you could see that, that whatever Paul said about them in chapters 9 through chapter 11 still applies today. So it was a common practice to resist the Holy Spirit. Wow. Number three, it was a historical practice. As your fathers did, so do you. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years between the wilderness and Acts chapter 7. And it was historical for the Jews to resist the Holy Spirit. And number four, it was a deceptive practice. Self-deception about their relationship with God and to the law. They were totally deceived. And we looked at that. Well, what does it say? Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they, uh, and they have slain them, which show before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. They were deceived and thinking they were keeping the law when they weren't. And so we brought it up to speed to say, what about us? How do you know if you and I, or we are resisting the Holy Spirit? Well, one reason is there's a lot of rationalization. We just will not yield to the written word of God. That, to me, is the first evidence of resisting the Holy Spirit, and that is not receiving what God has said. And that goes on a lot with the vast majority of people that I have known claiming to be believers. Number two, refusing to yield the life to the complete control of God. It's not that it can't be done, it's that it needs to be done. And we need to be doing it, and we need to make that conscious choice every day. Every day that we get up. Thank you, Lord, 
for another day and may you continue to bless this day and may I walk in a way that glorifies you. That has to be the goal, the mindset. Number three, having an ungodly religion, just like these Jews. There are a lot of people that have an ungodly religion. Now, what do I mean by an ungodly religion? Well, I mean just that. It's a religion that either does not submit to God or a religion that God is not central in its focus. There are a lot of people today, just briefly, that want to hang on to their denominationalism. There's nowhere in Scripture for that, nothing in Scripture for that, but they do it anyway. They hang on it tenaciously, even more so than the Word of God. Well, that certainly isn't pleasing God. I mean, some people might be shocked to know that I have two um, ordination certificates, one for missionary Baptist, which I guess they expect because I'm black, so they expect Negroes to have a missionary Baptist um, ordination, but the shocker is I'm also ordained as a Southern Baptist preacher. So that's even more shocking because they, how in the world did you, of all people, become ordained as a Southern Baptist? Well, there's a history behind that and I don't care to get into it because that's not relevant to anything. But the Southern Baptist Convention, their um, newly elected president, is a lunatic. You know, dude is flat out lost. He's teaching the same the same kind of word faith heresy nonsense that those other lunatics teach. And I don't give a hoot and holler about some man's person. I just don't. Because God certainly does. He respects no man's face. So why should I? And the dude is teaching error and false doctrine, but understand he was elected. He didn't just waltz into the Southern Baptist denomination and start teaching heresy. He was elected as their president. And that whole denomination is going crazy now because they got the lunatic at the top. And I just go, I don't care about that. I'm going to follow the word. I've been warning Southern Baptists and everybody else, you better stop putting your focus on your denomination and put your focus on what that scripture says. Or else you might wind up serving an ungodly religion, not even realize it. Uh, and there are people that will object and they're loyal to their denomination. What nonsense. You need to be loyal to the Lord. Period. And if you're not, you got a big problem. Number four, placing beliefs and feelings and emotions before obedience to the word of God. Yeah, that's, that's common practice. And what that is, is resisting the spirit. Number five, waiting for a so-called leading of the Holy Spirit when God has already spoken through the written word. Uh, or as Harley Howard would say, prayer is no substitute for action. Where God has already spoken, we don't need to be waiting for anything. We need to be doing it. I'm just waiting on the Lord. What do you think that means? Those who even stated that in Scripture, they weren't sitting on their behinds waiting for some leading. They were always obedient in motion, in action. So if you're waiting on the Lord, you're waiting on the way, doing something for God. You look at Paul in the book of Acts, and we'll see this down the road where Paul wanted to go here, and the Lord said no, wanted to go there, the Spirit said no. But you didn't see Paul go... <sighs> I, think I'm just, I, I want to do God's will, but I guess I'll just wait here until I get the leading. No, Paul kept going. He kept moving towards what he believed the will of God was, and the Spirit said, go to Macedonia. But he didn't sit down and wait. As some people did, he been waiting for 20, 30 years, <laughs> waiting too long. We need to get up. Number six, resisting the Holy Spirit is inexcusable. Why? Because it short circuits God's blessings to us. Certainly does. And last, I think one of the great telltale signs of how you and I can know if you're resisting the Holy Spirit is the fact that some folk refuse to be saved and they need to be. There's no question. Another thing I find remarkable about Stephen's life as he comes on the scene and really goes off the scene so quickly, his life is a beacon of light and an example of faith in the face of certain death, um, I've seen that there is a tremendous likeness or parallel between Stephen and the Lord. Very interesting. And there is no man, I believe, on the pages of the New Testament whose life parallels the life of the Lord Jesus more than Stephen's. And really, I am a little surprised that not much is written about this, and I want to look at some examples. And we're going to do this comparison. First, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's Luke 3, verses 21 and 22. And then Stephen's life, Acts 6, verse 5. Both were filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, 
Jesus exposed religious hypocrisy. One of my favorite chapters, Matthew chapter 23, verses 21 through 33. And then Stephen exposed religious hypocrisy in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Jesus was arrested falsely, John 18, verses 33 through 38. Stephen was arrested falsely, Acts chapter 6, verse 12. False witnesses testify against Jesus, that's Mark 14, verses 55 through 59. And false witnesses testify against Stephen in Acts chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. Both quoted similar statements, both Jesus and Stephen, in Matthew uh, 23, verses 34 through 36, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Jesus was unwavering in the face of death, and that's Mark chapter 14, verses 60 through 65. And Stephen, as we'll see, was unwavering in the face of death, and that's again Acts 7, verses 55 through 56. Jesus committed his spirit into the hands of his father, Luke chapter 23, verses 40, uh, verse 46. And Stephen committed his spirit into the hands of God, Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Jesus died asking forgiveness for his enemies, Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 34. And Stephen died asking forgiveness for his enemies, Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Amazing parallels. Amazing parallels. Just just wonderful truth. Now, Stephen, uh, a man of faith, as we saw, a man of courage, now becomes uh, Stephen the martyr. The word martyr uh, means one who bears witness by his death, whose life and actions testified to the worth and the effect of faith. Both are true of this man Stephen and both are true of every Christian today whether you understand or not you are a martyr we are all martyrs you say what yeah yeah we 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 like to play little word games we're going to see the word witness or oh, we're witnesses what do you think the word in Greek means the same word you see I, I just cannot understand and I never will understand the profound ignorance of the Bible that we, we protect and cherish and, and continue to seek. We, we continue to seek more ignorance. In the face of clear theology, clear truth, we seek to be more stupid. Or is stupider? <laughs> more stupid, just dumbed down than ever before. If I were to ask you and everybody else how many of you are witnesses for Christ... I am sure that most of us would affirm that we are a witness. I don't think there'd be any question. Most people haven't the faintest idea what the word witness means. The word witness is the exact word in the scripture for martyr. Same Greek word. But people either don't know or don't care, but it's there. So when you say that you're a witness for Jesus Christ, which really means you are a martyr, what you are saying is that you will bear witness of Christ even to the point of death without reservation and that your life testifies to the worth of being a witness or a martyr as a demonstration of your faith in Christ. That's what they understood the word witness to mean and that's what they understood the word martyr to mean and that is the understanding of the word. It still means the same thing. And we have seen demonstrations of this. The killing and the beheading of believers by this radical so-called ISIS group. They were killing believers. What you saw was what a martyr is, a witness. Someone who trusts Christ to the point of death. Of being killed. We just don't believe that. And we don't demonstrate because we don't really live for him in a way that we would be worth or worthy of dying or even count, being counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. We wouldn't even go that far. Stephen has denounced the utter hypocrisy of these religious leaders by calling them in verses 51 through 53, what amounts to rebellious heathens, a generation of perpetual murderers of God's messengers, which heinous evil culminated in the betrayal and murder of the very Messiah they were looking for. They were religious phonies 
who, although displaying a shabby outward show of keeping the law, they did not keep any of it. That's about right. That's, that's, a, that's a, a proper summation. That's what he said of these people. They weren't keeping any of the law. When I, was, when I went through the Gospel of John, what was so utterly amazing, the many times that Jesus said these religious leaders, they didn't know the Father at all. They spent all their religious life claiming to know God, claiming to be teachers of God, uh, about God, as, as in Romans chapters 2 and 3, and that they were the lights of the people and the blah, blah, blah. And if you want to know about God, you have to come through them. Jesus said, you don't know the Father. Because if you knew the Father, you would be loving me and accepting me. I mean, he just flat out told them, everything about your religion is a sham. Every single thing about your religion. You read the law, you study the law, but you don't know the purpose of it. You don't know God's purpose in the law was to bring you to me, and they wouldn't come to Christ that they might have life. Wow. He denounced their entire religion as worthless. Whew. Stephen can tarry, uh, carries on the same tradition. When they heard these things, verse 54, they thanked Stephen and uh, they repented of their... No? When they heard these things, they took it to mind that we'll see, come back another day, bruh, and we're going to go to the mountain and have a retreat and discuss these things. No? Must be that newfangled version. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Wow. The Jewish leaders were cut to the heart, meaning that their hearts were sawn asunder. They were torn apart by the words of Stephen. They were broken up in their minds and their hearts. That's what happens with the word exposes their sin. The word of God had exposed and destroyed their hypocrisy. They don't like that. People who are hypocrites don't like it when they are revealed for the hypocrite that they are. They love to dwell in the darkness, in the secret chambers of their false religion and their fake beliefs. But when someone who is spirit-filled and with the wisdom of God comes along and literally destroys that hypocrisy, they will get mad. Either they Listen, they're going to get mad or they're going to get saved. That's it. Those are the only alternatives in Scripture. They get mad or they get saved. The, the first church, they were cut to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what must we do? They wanted to rectify this problem. What is it that we can do to rectify the problem? And they said, you can't do anything, but God has already provided a means through Christ and salvation. And they gladly received the word. So we saw when they were cut, they gladly received the word. And when these guys were cut, they gladly wanted to get rid of that word. That word exposed them. We don't like exposure. We like to think every day we get up, we're just perfect, just the way we are. Then why have any church? What do we, if, if the whole purpose of the church is to get together and to pat our backs in our religion, why go to church? Why have a church? If there's nothing to challenge us to grow, why go? Why do we have one? Why do we need one? Why is that we don't think that we need to have correction and growth? And we don't need it. Okay, then there's no need to go to church. I agree, some people don't need to go at all. For one, you've been going, it's a waste of time. And two, you need to be saved and find a place that's going to challenge and teach you the word. Verse 54 says, they gnashed on him with their teeth. Their teeth were grinding together. Wow, that's anger. That is real anger. When you see someone so mad, they're just they're, they're grinding their teeth. That's the point you want to be leaving somebody's presence. Some people say they were growling at Stephen, and I believe that. Some folk get real mad, and they commence to doing the fight on you, be, be growling at you. I had that happen to me one time at Family of Faith. This dude, was, I'm like, boy, you better stand down, son. You better get out of my face. <laughs> like, really? Oh, it's going to be like that. <laughs> that growl in my face. I said, boy, I'm being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And what are you being obedient to? Come here, growling in my face. You must be insane. You better stand down, son. 
Like, what, you want a bone or something? What's wrong with you? Get out of your ever-loving mind. <laughs> they, were at the, they were at the point of madness. This is often the result of those who do not want to hear the truth. They don't, and they get crazy. They sure do, and you're going to see one of the craziest people when we talk about Saul. He went crazy. He was part of that crowd of where Stephen was and Stephen preaching to. And Paul was super zealous. You know he was mad. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Oh, that was it. That was it. That was it for them. That was it. I mean, here Stephen was at the doorway of death. And it led to the entrance where Jesus was standing to receive him. Remember, nowhere in the Bible do we see Jesus standing at God's right hand for anyone else. Stephen was the first martyr recorded in scripture to die for Jesus. And he died looking at Jesus. But they couldn't hear that. Verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon it with one accord. This is incredible. This is madness, insanity, craziness. Wow. This vile bunch of, of despicable band of religious hypocrites who thought that all this business of Jesus ended at his death could not stand to hear any more about Jesus. They didn't like him when he was on earth. And then here you got Stephen saying, oh, the heavens open and standing at the right hand of God is Jesus. That's it. That's it. Enough of that. You're going to die today. And every time that these religious folks decided to persecute the saints, it was a means that God used to expand <laughs> the actual preaching of the gospel itself. They hated Jesus. They now vented their hatred on all those who were called by his name. To hear that Jesus, the one who these religious hypocrites hated, was at the right hand of God, was the vilest of all blasphemies they could ever hear or imagine. Stephen must die. There was no trial or nothing. No, no, no. They figured, okay, that's it. You're dead. He cast him out the city, verse 58. And stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So they, they all covered their ears to drown out Stephen's voice with their shouting. And they all ran upon him at the same time and dragged him out of the city and killed him with stones. And those who stoned him laid down their coats at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul. Now I'm going to wait to chapter 8 to talk about Saul, which isn't going to be that long, frankly except to say that this is the first time that we see Saul in Scripture. So I'm going to interchange, not intentionally, it's just that I've been so used to Paul and Saul, you know I'm talking about the same person. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Stephen's calling upon God. Look very carefully, and look very simply what the text is saying. Then I'm going to ask you what it means. I'm giving you heads up right now. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What does that tell you? Right. What else? Right. What else? If you are where I think you are, look at the paragraph under verse 59. What does it say? Exactly. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, remember, look, look carefully at what the verses are saying. If you ever wanted to know who Jesus is, according to scripture, just look carefully at what it says. Because there are people saying that Jesus is not God the Son. Well, they're wrong, because that's what it's saying here. 
calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Simple. Keep looking carefully at what the passages say. Verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said that, he fell asleep. So you have an incident here where they're just bashing the life out of this man with these huge stones. And he cries up with a loud voice so that they could all hear it. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge or to their account, which is exactly the same thing Jesus said when they crucified him. And so with this triumphal shout of mercy for his murderers, the Bible said he fell asleep. That's a beautiful way to say that he died. He fell asleep. Now, usually when you fall asleep, what happens eventually? You wake up. That's exactly right. And that's another thing people need to see. That the Bible gives the, the clear impression that death for the believer is temporal. And if you study even Paul's writings later in the Corinthians epistles and other epistles, he says, you know, he talks about that the, the believer is going to wake up. You know, he talks in First Thessalonians about, about those who have fallen asleep. It, it talks, that talks about death. Believers, they sleep. Because one day we're going to be awakened to new bodies and new life that we have yet to experience in the future. So the believer's death is sleep. The heathen's death is death. And they will suffer the second death. That's eternal death. But the believer will never experience that. The believer's death is just asleep. We're just taking a long nap. So, again, hopefully we have a better understanding of what this word witness is. Because you hear people talk about witnessing and they think it's something you do. And, of course, that's not what it says at all. Witnessing is not something you do or something you can say, but it is what you are. If you're a Christian, you're already a martyr. So you're not looking to do anything any more fantastic than what you already are. If you are a witness, and if you bear witness uh, to Christ, you'll do so even at the point of death and be willing to die because your life testifies the worth of your faith. It testifies the worth of you following Christ. If you're not willing to do that, now, I'll just let Jesus say it in Luke 9, 23 through 26, and we move on to the 8th chapter. And he said to them, to them all and this is this huge crowd following Jesus he always had huge crowds following him and he turns to this crowd this huge crowd you, you, you would think today if we got huge crowds it would alter the message we just, just praise God we have all these huge crowds following him so Jesus had this massive crowd and verse 23 says he said to them all if any man will come after me that's what it means to be a disciple. Amathetes in the Greek. If you want to be my disciple, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Wow. That is a fantastic statement. Let him deny himself. If you want to be my Amathetes, you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. What? Most people aren't thinking that would deny myself. I'm not, I'm not, I come to Jesus to indulge myself. Well, you might have came to Jesus, but you didn't come to Jesus, okay? Because he said, you want to come after me. And think about it. Here's this crowd thinking that they're already following him. He says, anyone coming after me, God deny himself. Number two, take up your cross daily. The cross was a symbol of what? That's it. That's the only thing the cross symbolized. And when they talked about the cross, that's exactly what it meant. Let him deny himself and die daily and follow me. Wow. Preach that today, see what happens. Verse 24, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whew, wow. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Wow! Taking up the cross, following Jesus, means literally to give up your life and not to save it or protect it. Hmm. Interesting. 
And the apostles demonstrated exactly what Jesus said. For what is a man advantageth if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? What is the advantage to live for this life and to indulge in everything in this life even if you gain the entire world? And no one will ever do that. And yet you lose your own soul. Cast away in the judgment. What was the, what was the purpose of it? What's the advantage of that? And then you lose your own soul. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come into his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. The Lord said, if you're ashamed of me, don't worry, I'll deny you too. Wow. I was talking to Zerus about this last night that really I'm getting sick and tired of everybody pushing every heathen into heaven. People act like, like they know what heaven is. They don't know what they're talking about. They got Michael Jackson in heaven. They got Prince in heaven. They got Ray Charles in heaven. They got Hitler in heaven. Got, everybody's going to heaven. And these are all people that live their lives as complete reprobates and in rebellion of the will of God and everybody's got these reprobates and their their idols going to heaven. And Elvis is in heaven. He's singing and and, and people got, well, the Lord needed this and that. Y'all you, you need to shut up that foolishness, that blasphemous nonsense. God doesn't need anything. And if you didn't live for Christ, you ain't going there. It's amazing how all these imbeciles want to push everybody to heaven. Who don't even live for the Lord. Well, you know, who's to say the last second that they did? Shut up. Who's to say you don't know what you're talking about? People that live for themselves and hate Christ usually die outside of Christ. And because this person made you tingle and feel good for some stupid record or some purple rain don't mean they're in heaven. And Elvis ain't there too. He left the building and went to hell. And if you don't believe that, you got a big problem. That's your issue. And Prince ain't there. And Michael Jackson ain't there. And nobody else you push in there is there because you wanted to be there. People are in heaven because they serve the Lord. And they love the Lord. And everybody else is going to the lake of fire. Wake up. Everybody ain't going there. And they ain't a better place. Well, if it's so better, why don't you go there? Mm -hmm, you don't want to go either. Now we're going to talk about Paul or Saul the Pharisee and the persecution of the church. So we're moving to the 8th chapter right now. And so in our study of the 7th chapter, we looked at the death of Stephen. We want to be reminded that this great saint of God was the first martyr for the Lord. That is recorded in scripture. We saw that his life was so much like his Savior that in his death that he saw Jesus standing up at the right hand of God to receive him into glory. And his life was such a great example for all of us, of one who, even in the face of certain death, proclaimed the word of God boldly. Amazing. There amongst the crowd of Stephen's accusers and killers stood a young man giving his consent or approval to the death of this brave follower of Jesus Christ. And this man's name is Saul. Again, later, he's going to be changed to, to Paul. Paul is yet another character study from this great book of Acts. And his story will begin here and will finish at the end of the book of Acts. And 14 letters of the New Testament later, his life will finish as well. As with Stephen, Saul or Paul is an example of how God can take the chief of sinners and converts him to his own faithful servant. This is another thing that seems to bother me about all these fake confessions. Now Donald Trump, oh hallelujah, has now professed Christianity. Now he's a believer. And, you know, Jimmy Dobson, of course, got his hand in the mix. And so now people like me, Mr. I don't believe this nonsense for a second. I'm going to tell you why right now. Number one, Harley Howard has no respect to person. Zero. When James Dobson says something, I don't believe it because James Dobson said it. I don't care what James Dobson says. If this man is saved, 
if Donald Trump is saved, watch what he does with his former sins. He will renounce them. If he doesn't publicly renounce them, that's telling you he's not saved. He's not. Watch what happens. Watch all the examples in the New Testament of people who get saved. Watch what they do with their former lifestyle. If Donald Trump were saved, the first thing he would do would be renouncing his lifestyle publicly, saying, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, and thank God I'm saved, now renouncing my entire vain lifestyle, which is basically the worship of the Donald. Let's see if that happens. Then he'd have a long line of apologies to make to a lot of people for destroying their character and lives. So if you're asking me, am I stupid enough to hold my breath? I don't think so. But I will say this. I hope I'm totally wrong. <laughs> but I don't think so. We'll see. But this idea, because somebody said that he made a profession, James Dobson can't make nobody no Christian more than he can make himself Abe Lincoln. So I don't believe nothing James Dobson says. I want to see what God is doing in that reprobate's life if he truly saved. So we wait. And we'll see. I'm, just, I'm waiting for the public renouncing of the lifestyle. Don't forget, I'm not holding my breath. And Saul was consenting unto his, his being Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Stop right there. Now, where was the church? In Jerusalem. That's, that's exactly where that church was. Uh, where did Jesus say the word should go for before Jesus ascended into heaven, where did he say that the word was to go for? Where were they to preach it? Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But the church was in Jerusalem. But Jesus didn't say keep it there. And they kept it there for a while. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. So right at that moment, when Stephen was murdered, I mean, it was subtle at the first with the beating of the leaders, the threatening of the leaders and what have you, but now it was open season for persecution. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay. Now it's moving where where God wants it to move. Above all the screams of this mad religious crowd, this young man witnessed something that was unbelievable. A man who was tried and falsely accused, dragged and stoned to death unjustly, asking forgiveness for all of his enemies that crushed him with stones. And I do believe to this day, and I believe the New Testament teaches, if you read it all, that the love that was displayed by Stephen really affected Saul. It affected him a lot. And I'm sure he thought, as most of the other religious leaders thought, that the end of this Jesus movement would come as a result of his death. And with their leader gone, surely Paul and many of the religious leadership thought that this would be the end of all this foolishness about Jesus. So they said, this, we ain't going to worry about it. But it didn't stop anything. Maybe if we threaten them, this will stop the movement. Nope. If threats will not work, then beatings will surely stop the movements. We have only afflicted pain upon their dead leader, not upon them. So if we start beating them and start threatening them, well, that'll stop it. Nope. Didn't stop it at all. In fact, the church kept growing. So when this crowd saw Stephen was fearless in the face of death. It brought terror upon the hearts of these religious leaders. They didn't know how to, what to do about it. We have to stop this thing. We, but we don't know how. Nothing we do stops them. It keeps growing. We just have to exterminate it. And I believe that Saul saw that the followers of Christ would not be intimidated by threats and beatings and could not be stopped even by death. It brought panic in his heart. I mean, Paul was an, a strong if not the strongest advocate for the Jews religion he was sold out to the Jews religion he wasn't going to let Christianity stop the Jews religion Paul thought that the only way to stop the movement was to kill all the Christians 
And so begins the great persecution of the church and the maddening rage on the part of Paul or Saul to eliminate the church. In verse 1, where it says that Paul consented to the death of Stephen, the word consent means it brought pleasure. So Paul was pleased and delighted in his own heart to see Stephen die, and he was going to have the same kind of heart and attitude towards seeing other Christians suffer and die. It's amazing. So this is confirmed by what he says of himself. And we want to take a look at some of those passages, beginning at 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 12 through 13. We're going to see what Paul said of himself in regards to the church. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, I'm going to need some glasses here because this other print is very small. Uh, verses 12 and 13. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief or because of my ignorance and unbelief and I want to take a look at those words there he was a blasphemer meaning that he was impious against God he was railing against God and the saints and a persecutor. In other words, he was a persecutor. And injurious means uh, a maltreater. A despiteful person. Could refer to torture. I mean, this guy was crazy. But I obtained mercy. So when you look at Paul or Saul, you have to look at what he said of himself. Let's take a look at Acts 22. Acts chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. Okay, again, look at what Paul said of himself. Acts 22, verses 3 through 5. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, remember that, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day, and I persecuted this way unto the death. He persecuted the church unto death, killing believers. Wow. Binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. The word punished in that verse means inflicted. A penalty. Wow. Punishment for being a believer. But this is what Paul did, or rather Saul did. What else? Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. Remember, look at what Paul said of himself. And I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth which things I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prisons, having received authority from the, the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. In other words, I said, yeah, kill them. Kill them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. The word blaspheme is to speak evil. To, to revile, to speak evil of Christ. He wanted to get them to blaspheme their faith. And what is it? And being exceedingly mad against them. That means Paul was in a rage. Super abundantly raging. The dude was crazy. He wasn't just mad. He was insane. Super abundant in his rage against them. I persecuted them, even unto strange cities. Wow. He caused them to suffer, even in strange or foreign lands. He wasn't even supposed to go there. You violate the law so he can go kill Christians. That's how much he hated the church. That's what happened when the great persecution began. What else? Well, that should do it. That should do it. It also is confirmed by what Jesus 
uh, by what Luke says in Acts 8.3. And we'll see that momentarily. So let's go back to uh, verse 1 of the 8th chapter. We're wrapping this up pretty soon in about 10 minutes or, or less. Look at this remarkable truth in verse 1. Again. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at the time there was a great persecution against the church, excuse me, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I love that. I love that. Up until this time, the church did not go into the place where Jesus had commanded them to go. The, the Lord never told them to stop at Jerusalem. Very clear. Judea, Samaria, are the most parts of the earth. And they weren't going. Okay. It's time to make a little movement now. Because okay, there's no indication they weren't going to go anywhere else. Okay. You're going to be going. Real quick. Real quick. He used the persecution of Paul and others to fulfill his own divine plan. Wow. And we'll see that in verse 4. He used this person. Listen. I keep thinking. My boy said. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. They wanted that boy in that pit, Joseph in the pit, never to be seen again. They said, we can't kill our brother. We'll just sell him into slavery then. Make it this whole story about what happened to him. Many years later, many trials later, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Even in the evil that others perpetrate against us, God will take that and use it for his good. That is an incredible statement. It's a hard statement to grasp if we're not used to just looking at the word, seeing what the word says, and going, you know what, that's what God said, I have to believe. It. Because it's going to take a lot of humility to see the bigger picture. And sometimes you don't see it. I don't think Joseph saw it for a long time. Not only was he in slavery, and then was sold into slavery, and then was elevated, but then he had to deal with, you know, the wife of the king and her lies, back to prison. Then he had these visions and everything, and or or the the the, the baker and the other servant of the king had these visions and. Joseph interpreted the visions. And he said, look, you know, when the thing comes to pass, don't forget me. Don't forget to tell the king that I, I helped you in all this. Oh, we're not going to forget you. We got him for over two years. And then, oh, my goodness, I forgot this, this guy, Joseph. I forgot. Oh, I now recognize my error because I remember now, two years plus later, that Joseph is in jail. I forgot all about, oh man, he's going to be so mad. And then God used that to elevate Joseph to the place of second in command of Egypt. Why? So that when the Jews ran out of food, they had to go to Egypt to get food. And the one who was on the throne was their, one of their own sons. <sighs> you talk about God's wonderful plan. That's part of the wonderful plan. How God can take the pain and use it. And even Stephen's death was used as a glorification to God. Amazing. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him, of course. And I had mentioned it was interesting to note that some who were greatly used of God died with only a few friends in hand. You look at John the Baptist, in Matthew 14, verses 1 through 12, or even Jesus, in Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35, and verses 48 through 56, and in chapter 27, verses 35 through 39, verses 45 through 50, and verses 55 through 61. Jesus died when his, his whole band of apostles forsook him, one betrayed him. That's incredible. All that Jesus did for these disciples, his apostles, and they all left. Even Paul died um, virtually alone, except for two men that sought him out. That's 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 11, and verses 16 through 18. The irony is that even 
Paul, or Saul, who would be later named Paul, would himself die in this fashion. Wow. As for Saul, verse 3, he made havoc of the church. Havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. He made havoc. Uh, he just he just unearthed, just just turned them over. He made havoc of the church. Let's take a look again at verse eight. Havoc is the word that means insult. Make sure I get this right. Well, make sure I get this word right here. Verse 3, Acts 8, 3. Sorry about that. To treat shamefully or with injury, to ravage, to devastate, and to ruin. That's what happened. Paul made havoc of the church. Entering into every house, because that's where what? That's where the, fellowship that's where the church is met. They met in the homes. Hailing men and women. He, the word hailing didn't mean Hi. And then he dragged them. He dragged them. Men and women committed them to prison. He cast them into prison. And it was a nice jail. So Paul was on a rampage. Let's take a look at one more passage as we wrap this up. And that's Galatians 1.13. Again, we get to see what Paul said of himself. And that's what's important. I don't need to speak for Paul. Paul can speak very clearly for himself. Galatians 1.13 For ye have heard of my, conver of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that, that beyond measure, wow, extremely, abundantly, overwhelmingly, super, he just went, he said, I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it. I ravaged the church. I ravaged it. I destroyed it. I went to overthrow it. Wow. I laid it to waste. This is what he said he did to the church. This is, this is how zealous he was. Paul was a madman. He was not some misguided religious radical. Paul went crazy in his efforts to eliminate the church. I'm just going to read verse 4. We'll, we'll study it uh, this afternoon. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> I love that. They didn't go hiding. They went preaching. Wow. We will pick up at this place, Lord willing, uh, this afternoon. That's amazing. Father, thank you again for the fact that persecution... Martyrdom, etc., never, ever stopped the word and stopped the church. Never. And may we learn our lesson today, Lord, in this age of just opulence and foolishness, that your word must go forth and that we must bring it forth to the lost. Bless continually this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to continue looking at Paul, and then we're going to be looking at how to believe the right things and still be lost, how to believe, be baptized, and actually follow the leaders and still be lost. Sad to say, but it's what the Bible says. So until 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time this day, Lord willing, we'll see you later.